morning to everyone at home watching online or Facebook or wherever. Well, under the old system, or the normal system, the speaker talks until morning tea. Under the summer system, I'm told the same still applies. So I'm here till 11 o'clock. Oh, I won't be quite that cruel. What I want to talk to you this morning is continuing on in the, uh, the studies in Galatians. And it's Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26. And while you're turning there, I'll talk to June and make sure we get some exploded Cheerios. <laughs> This is from a New King James, starting at verse 16. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you were led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. In other words, that's not an exhaustive list. If this was an act of parliament, it would say eustum generis, meaning things of a like nature, and the like. It's not an exhaustive list. And which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Well, since December 2019, the world has been more conscious of viral infections than ever before. In March 2020, the World Health Organization declared the infectious spread of COVID-19 to be a pandemic. Recommended precautions, face masks, distancing and isolation and all that stuff which you already know about. Vaccines, boosters and so on. Infections can be dangerous and precautions can be necessary. The same is true of spiritual infections. They can be spiritually dangerous and deadly. For instance, the writer of Hebrews talks about a root of bitterness springing up in an individual, the result of which is that many become defiled. You can read that in Hebrews 12, 15. Moses warned about the same thing way back in Deuteronomy 29, 18. Yeah, but wait, if bitterness can be spread by like an infection, could positive traits like joy also be spread like that? Of course, of course it can. The principle's the same. In fact, joy and similar traits might be viewed as vaccines against carnal spiritual infection. We can spread love, joy, peace, 
and other Christ-like traits to others. So I guess today you can choose to be a carrier of joy as you interact with others. You can be a super spreader of Christ-like traits wherever you go. But remember always that love is the motive for working. Joy is the strength for working. Uh, let's move on to the next one. The power of holiness. The believer should walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Now, when Paul says walk, he's not talking about left, right, left, right, left, right. He's talking about the way you conduct your life. That's the way you walk biblically, is the way you conduct your whole life. And to walk in or by the spirit is to allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. It's to remain in communion with him. It's to make decisions in the light of his holiness and Christ's holiness, not our own, because we don't have any of our own. Any holiness and righteousness that we have is all imputed to us through Christ Jesus. It is to be occupied with Christ because the Spirit's ministry is to engage the believer with the Lord Jesus. So thus, when we walk in the Spirit, the flesh or the self-life is treated as dead. We cannot be occupied at the same time with Christ and with sin. Now, this verse and those that follow show that the flesh is still present with the Christian. Never forget that. The idea of the eradication of the sinful nature in the flesh is refuted. It's still there. We still have a sinful nature in the flesh. And the war is always in the mind. Will the flesh prevail or will the spirit prevail? In verses 19 to 21, we see the list of the works of the flesh. There are those that involve sensuality, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. There are those that involve false religion, idolatry, sorcery, and heresies. They're all part of the sins of the flesh. And then you have those that are involved with human conflict. And this can be between individuals, it can be between groups, it can be between nations. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissension, envy, murders. And then you've got those that you might call social misbehavior, drunkenness, revelry, and things of that nature. The sins of the flesh, come on. It's jammed on me. Next one, number five, Chris. Can be placed into three broad categories. You've got sexual sins, you've got false religions and doctrines, and you've got social sins. Now remember, you can have a church which is, let's say, 90% right. They can also have false doctrines which they preach and teach that detract from the fullness of the gospel. Doesn't mean to say that they're not saved, it's just that they're teaching wrong things in some area. You see, the spirit and the flesh are in constant conflict. Yeah. 
Next one, Chris. God could have removed the fleshly nature from believers at the time of their conversion, but he chose not to. Why? Well, he wanted to keep us continually reminded of our own weakness. The minute you start to think that you've got the strength to do things on your own, you're in trouble. It's in God's strength that you do things. It's to keep us continually dependent on Christ, who is our priest and our advocate. And it also causes them to praise unceasingly the one who saved such worms. You might think, why do I refer to us as worms? Well, the scripture does in a number of occasions, particularly through the Psalms. All it's saying is, we're not worthy. There's nothing in us to commend us to God. It is his love for us. Far greater than words or pen can tell. If you fill the oceans with ink and try to write the sky, you drain the ocean dry and you still wouldn't be anywhere near talking about the love of God. And it's that love that sent Jesus. God became man because the perfect man, Adam, gave it away. The perfect man, Jesus, won it back. He won it back on the cross. He defeated sin. He was buried. He defeated death. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven where he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And from there, he is coming again to judge the world. And those who have placed their faith in Christ Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior will go to eternal life. For there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit and not after the flesh. But to those who have not believed or refuse to believe, as so many do, it's an act of rebellion and they will suffer the consequences, which is condemnation. They will suffer the wrath of God from which we've been saved. So, where's our focus? Uh, that's it got it focus the spirit of god does not lead people to look to the law as a means of justification rather he points them to the risen christ as the only ground of acceptance before god and as it tells us in romans 8 1 to 4 There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You see, the victory is not in ourselves. It's in the Holy Spirit who indwells us. A writer by the name of A.J. Gordon lists seven helps that actually come out of Romans 8. And I don't think it's a departure from what we're talking about. Seven helps of the Spirit. In verse 2, we get freedom in service. In verse 11, we get strength for service. In verse 13, we have victory over sin. In verse 14, we have guidance in service. 
In verse 16, we have to ourselves the witness of sonship and a joint heir with Jesus. In verse 26, we get assistance in service. And in verse 26 also, we get assistance in prayer. What a, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. Do we allow the Holy Spirit to have reign in our life like that? Or do we get so tied up with the idea of, well, it's always been done that way. Forget about man's tradition. Look at what God's word says. We've been through the works of the flesh, the works of fallen human nature, so I'm not going to repeat those. There's no difficulty in identifying them. Paul warns his readers <clears throat> that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The passage does not teach that a drunkard cannot be saved. I think a number of us here would know that from experience, not necessarily our own, but of people to whom we've witnessed. Drunkards can be saved. They're not condemned because they're drunkards. God still loves them. He still wants them to be saved. And you can talk about the other sins of the flesh in the same way. But the passage does say that those whose lives are characterized by that above catalogue of fleshly works are not saved. Those who practice, continually practice, their lives are characterized by those particular, that list of sins and others that are not mentioned in that list. So when your life is characterized, you continually practice that style of thing. Doesn't say you can't be saved, but if you continually practice it, you are rejecting God's offer of salvation. Lily thinks I was fair dinkum when I said I'm going till 11 o'clock. <laughs> well, why should Paul write in such a manner to churches of Christians? And of course, the reason is that not all who profess Christ are in fact truly saved. Some it's just intellectual knowledge. Others, they went forward somewhere along the line and they think, oh yeah, well, I... I said a few words and I go to church and I'm a good guy. I'm a nice person. I've got a nice car. I've got a nice home. I've got a nice dog. And I, that's not being a Christian. Yes, a Christian might be that, but that in itself is not being a Christian. You are a nice person with a nice home and a nice car and a nice dog and a nice wife and a nice kid and a nice husband and all that sort of stuff because you are a Christian. But that doesn't make you the Christian. It's a heart decision. It comes from the heart. It's more than an intellectual decision. It's significant that the apostle distinguishes between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. Now, of course, we know that John chapter 15 talks about Jesus being the, the vine and us being the branches. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into any depth in that, but to say this. Some years ago, I was sitting in a, I don't know whether it was a dentist surgery or anyway, it wasn't a very nice place. And I'm reading this gardening book. And it told me all about how to grow grapes. And in, in short, you can take a cutting off a grapevine. You can plant it. And it will grow and you'll have a beautiful grapevine. Green, leafy and all the rest of it. But you'll never get a grape off it. To get a grape off it, you have to take a cutting that has a sliver of the rootstock. And when you plant that with the rootstock, it doesn't have to be much, just a little sliver off the side. You plant that with the sliver of the rootstock, the vine grows, it grows, it's healthy, it's green, and the fruit just comes. It just hangs there. 
Why? Because the vine is connected to the rootstock. And the fruit of the spirit is the same. If you are connected and vitally connected to Christ Jesus, who is the rootstock of our life and our faith, then the fruit will just come because you are vitally connected to the rootstock. So there's nothing magical about it. It's just a fact. Stay connected to the rootstock. Stay connected to Jesus. And the fruit will come. And then, of course, remember that the word fruit is singular. It is not a plural. Oh, dear. I thought there were nine fruits of the Spirit. No, there's only one. That's love. The others are the various flavors. That's all. And you will find, as people develop in their Christian life, that love. If you've got the love of God in you, the love of God flowing through you, you will develop sometimes according to the personality that God has given you some of the other fruit of the Spirit, some of the other flavors. You might be a person who's kind and gentle, but you might occasionally have an outburst of anger. There's still a little bit of flesh there. Well, that's all right, because none of us are perfect until Jesus takes us home. Love, joy, we can all have joy. Peace, peace within, peace with God, peace with others. They're all things that develop. You don't have to work for it. It just comes as you stay connected to Jesus. Keep the vine vitally connected to the rootstock. On the next one, we see that love is what God is and what we ought to be. Some people say, oh, love is an attribute of God. No, it's not an attribute. It's what he is. That's a bit hard for us to get our brains around sometimes. That love is God. God is love. It's beautifully described in 1 Corinthians 13 and it's told out in all its fullness on the cross at Calvary. Joy is contentment and satisfaction with God and with his dealings. Peace could include the peace of God as well as harmonious relations with others. Long suffering is patience in afflictions, annoyances, and persecutions, and sometimes with pesky people. Peace in the life of the Redeemer. Long suffering. Kindness is gentleness, perhaps best explained in the attitude of the Lord towards little children. And next we have goodness. Goodness is kindness shown to others. Faithfulness may mean trust in God, confidence in our fellow Christians, fidelity or reliability. And the latter, reliability, is probably the meaning here. Faithfulness. You are a reliable person. You keep your promises. You do what you say you will do. And you remain faithful to the Lord. Gentleness is taking the lowly place as Jesus did when he washed the disciples' feet. <clears throat> Self-control means literally holding oneself in. That's especially so regarding sex. Our lives should be disciplined. Lust, passions, appetites, and temper should be ruled. We should practice moderation. And if you want a newspaper English passage, it'll read something like this. The fruit of the Spirit is an affectionate, lovable disposition, a radiant spirit and a cheerful temper. 
a tranquil mind and a quiet manner a forbearing patience in provoking circumstances and without and with trying people a sympathetic insight and tactful helpfulness generous judgment and a big soul charity loyalty and reliability under all circumstances humility that forgets self in the joy of others in all things self-mastered and self-controlled which is the final mark of perfection that's newspaper english it's easy english how striking is that in relation to 1 corinthians 13 and paul closes the list with the cryptic comment against such there is no law well of course there isn't because that's what god wants us to be they're pleasing to god they're beneficial to others and they're good for ourselves but it's not produced by our own effort it's produced by remaining connected to the rootstock jesus stay in communion with the lord obey him in daily life and as you do it's the holy spirit who works a wonderful miracle he transforms us into the likeness of christ you look at yourself in the mirror and you think to yourself oh, I don't look much different to what I did 40 years ago. That's right, Beryl, isn't it? Hey, what do you reckon, Grant? <laughs> See, we change in our appearance <clears throat> over life. And the same is as we walk the walk of the true Christian life, you change into the image of christ you are a different person today to what you were 30 years ago 20 years ago even 10 years ago <clears throat> god one patty thank you thank you trevor <clears throat> see paul puts it this way <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> saying that believers have crucified the flesh and its desires now the verb tense here indicates something that happened decisively in the past it actually occurred at the time of our conversion when we repented, there was a sense in which we nailed the old evil corrupt nature to the cross with all its affections and lusts. <clears throat> we determined that we would no longer live to cater to our fallen nature and that it would no longer dominate our life. Now, some people think because they've done it once, that's all they need to do. But that's a decision that has to be renewed continually. I'd suggest even daily in our lives. And I wish I could do it, but it doesn't always happen. But that's what our aim should be. To constantly keep the flesh in the place of death. <clears throat> See, this is your battle. Paul in Romans 7 19 says for the good that I will to do I do not but the evil I will not to do that I practice that sounds a bit convoluted but what he's actually saying in newspaper English I don't do what I want to do I want to do this but I find myself doing that it's the battle always between the spirit and the flesh and the battleground is in here it's in the mind if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit let us not become conceited provoking one another or envying one another the law could never give life it was never intended to be the christian's rule of life the law tells us when we've done something wrong. 
and the law should point us to Christ, who is the answer. Implicit in the gospel, that is at the heart of Galatians, is an understanding of Jesus as the Son of God, sent into the world to redeem people from the curse of the law, and of God's Spirit sent into the hearts of believers to make them children of God. In other words, to set us free from the penalty and the power of sin. We must not allow our freedom from the law to become an occasion for fleshly activity. We are accountable to each other and need to keep watch on others as well as on ourselves. The Holy Spirit is the key to living under God's grace. Only the indwelling Holy Spirit can fulfill the law through us as the life of Christ sets us truly free from the law of sin and death. And if you want a few pointers just to finish on, live under the Holy Spirit's control. Some people don't like that. They say, well, the Holy Spirit isn't there to control. The Holy Spirit is there to help. Yes, he is. But in order to help, you have to allow him to take the steering wheel. He's not a co-pilot. He's a pilot. Obey every leading of the Holy Spirit. And we do get leadings. Now, we often hear people talking about women's intuition. Well, quite often with Christians, that women's intuition is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Women tend to be more spiritual than men. You know that? Uh, Josh is shaking his head. But men put strength into the church. There's a difference. You see, you'll be careful how I say this, I suppose, but I'll say it anyway. Women are more spiritual than men. They are also more susceptible to listening to the wrong spirit. And you need the strength of men to listen to their wives, but then to make a judgment according to the word of God as to whether what the wife has heard or feels is of God or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, Josh is not an up and down now. He's, he agrees with that, so I'm safe. <laughs> so... I suppose I can say I've been in a situation where my first wife was a very spiritual woman, but she went right off track because she did not listen to what her husband said, the word of God said. And anyway, I, I, no, I shouldn't even have said that much. If you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will defeat fleshly desires not you might you will because the holy spirit is stronger than any fleshly desire and also believe that this will result in jesus life being reproduced in you now i don't know I've mentioned along the way where there are people who go to church who've made a commitment somewhere along the line. But has that commitment been real? If you've heard anything this morning that makes you think, have I really made Jesus the Lord of my life? Is he truly my Lord and Saviour? I'll leave you with that question. And if you have any doubts about it, come and talk to me. 
or to Alan, to Albert, Neil, Jim, Michael, talk to somebody, Sidney, Josh, talk to somebody about it. And if necessary, recommit your life to the Lord. And you will see a change. You will know a change in your life. Father, we come before you now in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. We thank you that at Christmas we reflect upon the, the absolute majesty of the miracle of the virgin birth. But we remember also that Jesus, born as a baby, grew to be a man. He knows the struggles of life. Then he bore our sin on the cross. We're told to crucify the cross. Crucifixion, the most terrible form of death that there was. Crucify the flesh. And Lord, that can be painful. But we know that in you we have victory. And through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, we will have victory. And Lord, that the the pain and the suffering of putting down the flesh is nothing compared to the joy that comes of a close relationship with you. And we thank you. Amen. Thanks, Trevor.